Hello, everybody. Uh, this session is Preventing Lateral Movement and Data Exploitation, uh, brought to you by TiVo Networks. Your speakers are Kellen Crandall and Joseph Salazar. Who, uh, my name is Joseph Salazar. I'm a technical deception engineer with about 20 years of information security experience in computer forensics, network defense, and uh, computer security incident response and SOC operations. Um, and I'd like to introduce Carolyn Crandall, who's the Chief Deception Officer and CMO. Carolyn. Hi there, thank you. So I am Carolyn. I am, as Joseph said, Chief Deception Officer and CMO of the TiVo Networks. I've been in the tech industry for about 30 years and about the last five or so with the TiVo Networks. And it has been a lot of fun and pleasure to see the deception marketplace grow and evolve and to morph into new and interesting things, which I'm looking forward to talking with you more about today. So let's uh, go ahead and jump right in. So on the topic of advanced attack detection, I always like to start from here, right? It, to have comprehensive security, you need to have a full stack. And a lot of people have made a lot of investments into technologies around the endpoint, around SIM, around uh, network monitoring, sandboxing, segmentation. And the latest and kind of uh, one of the more interesting tactics for detecting lateral movement is around deception and denial uh, tactics. And what you can see here is, is that you don't really want a security stack that's all the same. It may be layers deep, but it's all chocolate. Um, what you want to have is, is a variety of different controls doing different things within the network so that they complement and build upon each other and make it a lot harder for the attacker to be able to complete their mission. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joseph to talk about the anatomy of the attack and why this is so uh, challenging for any one single security control to stop and why we need to look at them collectively together. So over to you, Joseph. Thank you. So uh, for those of you who don't understand how attackers actually attack a network, you might be familiar with several different types of kill chains like Lockheed Martin and a few others. Now, this is the anatomy of an advanced attack. This is uh, based on a lot of research and, and um uh, looking at uh, past attacks, this is how advanced persistent threats and other advanced attackers generally do. And the first stage is initial recon. Now, it's important to note that this stage, at this stage, the attacker isn't interacting with the organization in any way, shape, or form. All of the information they're gathering is purely outside of the control of the organization. And that includes the entry point, meaning the person or the, the way they're choosing to interact with that uh, organization initially. So it could be a spear phishing email, it could be a watering hole attack on a, on a web page, it could be sending out links to a mul multiple people to see who clicks on it, etc. And they're also choosing the exploit based on what they know or what's been published about what types of software or, or organizational information is available on the target. Because once they've chosen that target, it's all about gathering information so that they can plan their attack. And when they do that initial compromise, they're going to establish a connection with whoever is currently the uh, target or the entry point that they're using. They're going to exploit a vulnerability, and then they're going to install some form of malware. And that malware is going to do several different things, or several different pieces of malware are going to do several different things. The idea is that they're going to try to exploit, to execute um, arbitrary code, and that execution arbitrary code gets them onto the system where they're going to do a remote access Trojan, or they're gonna establish a remote shell, or a callback shell, or something. And then they're going to install whatever tools they need, uh, minimally invasive as possible, to gain access to that system. And once they've done that, then they're going to install their back doors to make sure they can keep coming back in, and they're going to do multiple different, they're gonna have multiple different ways to do this using multiple different uh, access points. They're going to establish command and control, and that is then to establish the presence on that initial foothold. Now, once they've established that initial foothold, they still have to go somewhere because that initial foothold is probably some low level system with a low level user that doesn't have administrative rights. And so they're going to try to obtain passwords or to privileged accounts. And they can do that by looking at local administrator accounts, seeing what other stored credentials are available, uh, who, seeing who belongs to um, you know, the elevated or privileged accounts that are available on Active Directory, for example. They're gonna gather the local data, look at what's available on the system. And they're going to crack stored hashes that are perhaps stored in memory uh, using something like Mimikatz. And once they've escalated privileges on that local machine, they're gonna start looking around to identify the next target. They're also going to be looking for target data because as they're looking around, they're going to identify the critical pieces of information that they can exploit. Now, it's interesting to note here that internal recon doesn't mean world, you know, full network scans because no one really scans anymore. There's enough information on the local endpoint that you can use it 
to move around very stealthily by doing point-to-point -point scans. For example, I can query Active Directory and look for service principal names for all HTTPS servers available on the network. And those are going to give me DNS names. And then by doing a DNS lookup, I can identify the IP address. And then from the IP address, I can just go point to point. From my, the system I control, I can start looking for open ports and services on that other IP. Or even very simply, I can look at what my, this, the current IP address is of the system that I've exploited first and go up or down one. I can increment or decrement the IP address, and then I can just do point to point. The important thing to note here is that attackers are patient. Having done red teaming and, pe and pen testing, um, you set artificial testing deadlines when you are doing uh, penetration testing, red teaming, and things like that because you need it, because you don't have a lot of time. Attackers have as much time as they want, right? The average dwell time is 56 days. So the, the attacker is going to be as patient as possible because the idea for them here is to move around and, and increase their foothold move laterally, establish your connections, exploit vulnerabilities, notice that it's the same thing as the initial compromise, install their malware and gain access. And then they're also going to establish the back doors, establish command and control, maintain their persistence, and then continue to escalate privileges. Now, as they're escalating privileges, the goal for them is domain administrator. So they're going to use tools like Bloodhound to map the ways and the, and the groups that they need to, to compromise to get to that point. This is what's called the persistence cycle. This is where the attacker spends a lot of their time. And eventually they're going to find enough information, escalate privileges and find the data that they seek so they can complete their mission, either exfiltrating that data, destroying the data, covering their tracks by deleting logs, and then disengaging from the, uh, from the initial the, the, um, infiltration. And then they can do whatever they want, contact the, the you, the, the organization for a ransomware demand, release the data, et cetera. Now, it's, like I said, that persistent cycle is where most of the attack happens. And this is because attackers take advantage of the inter internal detection blind spots that most other security controls have. If you think about every single breach in the past five years, every single one of them had a firewall, they had a SIM, they had EDR, they had antivirus, they had proxies, they had all the traditional security controls and yet the attackers were still successful. This is why the global mean time dwell, mean, median dwell time average is 56 days, and that's according to FireEye's Man, FireEye Mandiant's M-Trends report of 2020. If you look at a uh, more industry-wide um, report from the Potomac Institute, it's over 200 days. So this, like I said, is where the attackers are spending most of their time. Consider them mice in the walls, because that's exactly what they are. Now, the critical activities that they do in the persistence cycle, they're going to steal credentials, whether it's local credentials stored at the endpoint or active directory credentials. Because as a, a member system, the exploited, that exploited initial uh, computer will have query rights to active directory because it's a member system. And so the attacker using that system can query at active directory for anything they want, every single account, every single object, domain controller, et cetera. And then they're going to do this for privilege escalation. They're going to collect data, whether it's local data that's already stored on the system, shared data on network shares or on removable media. They're going to conduct reconnaissance, as I said earlier, port and service scans and, the active do and that active directory reconnaissance. And then they're going to compromise those services, whether it's connecting to open ports, exploiting vulnerable services, because as I connect an open port, I know that there's a service behind it. And using uh, querying and telnetting to that system, even just checking and querying and probing that service, I can tell the version of the software that's running, and then I can use an exploit that targets that specific version. Or I can even just spread to systems that are already connected, like SMB shares, mapped shares. So all of these things are what happens during that persistent cycle. And it's important to note then that this is why you need more than just one single monolithic uh, con security control environment. You need things that not only look and try to prevent the initial exploit, but can detect the attacker as they try to do discovery, lateral movement, and privilege escalation activities. And that's the point of deception. All right. So obviously a lot of a uh, lot of complexity, a lot of steps as the attacker progresses. And there's that, you know, that framework, the MITRE framework. There's a lot of really good 
uh, tools that are out there today to be able to look at the different attack, uh, you know, attack activities, the tactics that they use, and how your different security controls within your stack are designed to address the different aspects of, of an attack. Um, it's interesting when we take a look at one of the most effective ways to stop an attack, obviously, to stop it from the initial compromise in the first place, but we know how challenging that is to do today and, and the frequency of false positives and even missed alerts. And so how do you put a layer of defense in place that really takes a look at stopping the attacker's ability to move laterally off of the endpoint? And so with the modern deception that's out there today and the techniques that are available, you can take a look at the different ways that an attacker is going to try to move off of that endpoint. And, and just talking about a few of the kind of stats behind it, is it important? Yes, it's important to detect early because it takes them less than five hours to infiltrate in and nine hours to break out. And uh, they can start exfiltrating data pretty quickly. But as we're seeing in more of the advanced attacks today, it's not really the, the smash and grab mentality anymore. It's use more of the APT style techniques to be able to, to get a better foothold on the network. And what we see is, um, as we break down the activities that they're going to do um, to achieve that, is, is they're obviously gonna steal credentials as Joseph talked about. They're gonna look at maybe even stealing those credentials while they're in transit during a man in the middle attack. Um, they're going to use other aspects of discovery and reconnaissance, right, in order to find particular network assets or maybe file servers and shares that they're trying to, um, to exploit. Um, they're going to look for active ports that they'll be able to exploit. And then they're also going to look at Active Directory. And we've definitely seen an uptick in attackers looking at going directly after activity because why not go for the crown jewels? And so it is an aspect that a lot of people felt protected was before, but given the amount of information there, it should be elevated on everybody's attention spectrum to be able to stop an attacker from successfully exploiting or enumerating Active Directory. And then the last aspect of it is, is, as Joseph outlined in the different attack phases, they need to be able to have, an attacker needs to be able to have the, the paths to be able to move. And there's some interesting tools that come out of um, the machine learning that Deception uses to learn and mirror match the assets on the environment to be able to show the attack paths. And that's how an attacker would move laterally through the network based upon those expos exposed credentials, orphan credentials, other misconfigurations that presents opportunity. And so what this is all designed to do and what you'll hear about are different techniques to be able to lock down that endpoint make every endpoint a decoy and really make it so that you're not actually waiting for a full exploitation, but you're actually able to detect activity as early as the point of, of observation. So let's get into um, how you go about disrupting discovery and lateral movement. And so simple diagram here, you get your typical threat actor who's going to come in and they're going to, uh, to look for the target assets. So they're going to compromise that first endpoint. They're going to look laterally to move, the, move to these new targets. But an interesting of the, uh, the hide, and, uh, hide and deny access to things is what if you can create an environment that's not your traditional trapping, but, but if it's able to actually hide these assets, whether they be an Active Directory server, maybe their files, folders, shares, removable drives, so that the attacker cannot even find what they're looking for. So any activity, they're not going to see the real thing. They're just going to see the deception objects, and that's going to give you a very high fidelity alert the attacker activity and give you the ability to, if you choose to, engage the attacker to get more TTP and other information. The second side of it is, is if you could go a step further and those automated tools that, uh, that Joseph had talked about before, what if you can give them information to misdirect their actions? So if you ask, uh, you know, ask for something, you're going to get a response back to it, but it's the information that you choose to give the attacker so that you can control their path into the deception environment. So this is some very new and innovation, innovative technology, which you can do to prevent that attacker from being able to move in the first place. The next thing that you can do to add an additional layer of defense is just obfuscate the entire attack surface. And this is where you put in decoys and interweave them through your production assets so that they can mirror match the uh, things that you're using on a daily basis. But they sit alongside in a non-disruptive way that when an attacker does go to do their reconnaissance and discovery activities, or steal the credentials, they're more likely to trip on a deception object and again, raise that notification. 
And so what we're going to now do is, is dig deeper into these different techniques. And I'm going to turn over to uh, Joseph to talk more about hiding and denying access to data. Great, thank you. So uh, there are several different things that you can do to actually conceal and deny access to the data that is that the attackers are looking for. As I mentioned earlier in the, in the attack cycle, attackers are constantly looking for information that they can use to either progress their attack or data that they can exploit or compromise in some way. So let's talk about things that are already on the, the endpoint. There are DFS and network shared drives and folders that you can hide based on particular policies. You can say which particular folders you want to hide. And there are local files and folders that attackers would normally use. Like every attacker knows that on a Windows system, there's going to be a user directory with a documents folder, uh, with app data that's hidden, and there's a whole bunch of other folders that are standard as part of a Windows build. Now, as an attacker, if I go CD user slash username slash documents, I'll get into the document folder. And if I decide that I wanted to steal or encrypt any of that data, I could. But denying access to both the network shares and the local folders prevents me from actually even seeing, or even if I know that it's there, changing directory to go to that location. And this really disrupts the ability of the attacker to gather information from that local endpoint. And then doing things like hiding map cloud storage, because you can map cloud storage as part of a, an endpoint. Though those documents that, that other people would normally use that you know, as, as an enterprise wide share, you can hide those as well. Now, attackers like to use, um, malware that can that will look for removal disks and spread through them so you know you've got a usb drive or, or an external hard drive that you plug into somebody anytime someone plugs into that uh to that usb port the malware will will write to it so that it, it's another vector of spreading what if you can hide those as well and then naturally credentials are one of the easiest things for an attacker to gain and it's one of the most useful things to progress their attack so if you hide both the local credentials that are and, and the data that's stored in local databases as well as active directory information like hiding the, the real domain administrator accounts hiding the real service principal name server addresses hiding the actual domain controllers and what systems you're logged into and, and giving fake information in their place, that really disrupts the attacker's ability to move around the production environment. But not only that, it actually diverts them to a decoy environment that then forces the engagement. And if the decoys are authentic looking enough and respond the way they're supposed to, you can spend hours in those decoys that are actually just recording everything that they're doing. So let me show you an example of what that actually looks like. So up on the top, is this and this is all from the same system up on the top you notice that we have several map chairs and several uh you know network documents that are available notice that there's a uh, docs.live.net which is a sharepoint server and notice that there is an x drive which is supposed to be mapped but if you look down at the bottom you'll notice that there are different servers that are mapped now here's the funny thing the top two servers are fake those are decoy systems. The bottom server is fake. That's a decoy share. Notice the X drive, which is actually the production drive, and the S drive, which is the SharePoint drive, are both missing from this system. Here's another example. This is the exact same directory um, uh, enumeration. On the left-hand side, you have command.exe. On the right-hand side, you have PowerShell. This is the exact same location notice under 3d objects you're missing custom reports.xls and documents.doc those are missing because they've been hidden from view carolyn all right so um digging into this uh, you know a little bit deeper so a great example to to understand the benefit of what uh what this type of technology can bring forward is is to think about ransomware attacks we know they're getting much more aggressive and, and persistent than they have been in the past and so if you apply how to hide the data um, it's helpful to think about how the attacker will will work in the first place so obviously they're going to look to spread and look for smb shares as well as the other credentials and uh, vulnerable systems that they may be seeking. And so um, 
they'll try to do this before they can have a chance to load the malware and encrypt the data. So in this case, what we're doing is, is the ransomware uh, in step one will infect the initial system and then it'll attempt to, to um, find files and shares to encrypt and spread to. But as Joseph showed in the prior screen, if they cannot find the actual production assets, they will not be able to cause any additional damage because the only thing that they will see are those decoy servers. So here you can have them not see the real things, only see the decoys, have them start to believe they're escalating their attack, encrypting on these fake shares. And in turn, what will happen is, is that we will um, raise an alert that this activity is going on. And then we can lead them into the decoy server so that all of the uh, telemetry can be picked up there. The other benefit that you get is, is given the native integrations that are built into a modern deception platform is that you'll also be able to take your endpoint systems and you'll be able to isolate that system off of the network and you'll be able to do additional blocking and even threat hunting to make sure that you can completely stop and eradicate this um, from advancing in their attack. So very powerful, right? Attackers can't uh, steal, encrypt, uh, tamper with things that they can't hide and see, but you also have a backup that you can also put decoy behind, drives out there on the network as well, and you can also engage the attacker to pick up additional information. Okay, so let's go on into the uh, defending the active directory. On uh, most of the attacks that we're seeing today, they are targeting Active Directory, and some people may go, well, well why? You know, 90% of companies are running Active Directory, and it's kind of interesting when you think about, you know, over 500 million active accounts, and they're authenticating over 10 billion times per day. So it's a tremendous amount of activity, and so trying to monitor for anomalous behavior can be very difficult. Um, and there's even stats that have been given forward by Microsoft that talk about how 95 million of those accounts are under attack every day. So um, obviously big focus, a lot of activity, and it makes sense because it's right, the king, keys to the kingdom. And once you're able to compromise this, you can pretty much move about anywhere you want to in a very stealthy and undetected way. And so as we look at how we do a better job in, in protecting Active Directory, it's, it's useful to take a look at, at how things work. So, you know, every member system has access to AD. Um, our attackers are gonna use this to live off of the land as part of their credential theft, their privilege escalation and lateral movement activity. Um, most Active Directory references um, discuss protecting the server and databases, um, managing or limiting the number of administrative or privileged accounts. But there are very few security controls that actively defend against Active Directory uh, discovery attacks. And so again, new innovation that is different than what you've, uh, what you've, seen, you've seen before. All right, so let's get into how the actual Active Directory attack works. So the attacker will compromise the initial, uh, initial system and they will try to look for ways to, to enumerate Active Directory. And as they do that, we go, sure, okay, you want to be able to get an Active Directory object, I'll give you that Active Directory object. It's actually a fake object that we're returning back to them, but we can do things like give them admin, service count information, critical computers, net sessions, et cetera, so that they believe that they have been successful with their, their attack. Now, when they try to go use any of that information, it's going to just lead them back into the decoy environment, where again, we can pick up telemetry about the attack and raise a very high fidelity alert so that, um, you know, so that the, the security teams can go ahead and remediate the infected system quickly. And it's a very powerful tool because again, you can't tamper with what you can't find, but also the attackers trust their tools. And if they start to realize that they can no longer trust their tools, it is going to dramatically slow their attack and work as, as a deterrent for them to want to continue to attack in an organization that has clearly, clearly made advanced investments into, into their detection technology. So let's get a little bit further into this. This is a you know, structure of how it works. You know, we hide AD, we feedback fake information, we steer their path into the decoys. But let's show now what an attacker will see as they attack. So over to you, Joseph. Thank you. So on the left-hand side, you see what a, uh, an attacker would normally use, which is Bloodhound, and it's what they would normally see. So the way Bloodhound works is that it will actually query all of Active Directory. It will look at all of the, the security groups and the member systems and all other objects. So accounts, user systems, you know, service accounts, et cetera. And it's going to look at all of that, create a map, and then outline how you get from the, the username that you have 
over to escalated privileges to escalate your privileges and eventually get domain administrator. So on the left hand side is what happens when Bloodhound works without any kind of active directory protection. So the account Jeff at Acme is a member of the IT workstations group. That IT workstations group has an administrative access to the system that Bob at Acme is logged on to. And Bob is a member of the backup admin and has a session to the database. Now using that information, that means that I is, if I use Jeff's account, I can compromise the database by using the administrative access to Bob's um, uh, system which has an open session to the database and accessing that database. But not only that, I now know that Bob is also a member of the backup admin group, which has generally higher privileges than my user account. So now I can exploit the net sessions, the AD group membership and everything else to breach that database server and gain access. Now with Active Directory interception, by preventing him from seeing the real actual production information and instead giving him decoys, he's going to think that he has admin and has a session to a decoy database, but what, I mean, to an actual database, but what he's actually getting to is a decoy database that then will record everything that he does. So by giving him fake information at the start when he's trying to gather the data that he needs to escalate privileges, you are completely derailing his attack and diverting him to a decoy environment. So let's see what that looks like. So up on the top is an unprotected system, an unprotected user, now down at the bottom, is another system on the same active directory, but with the protection. Now, in this particular case, you're looking for domain, the domain controller. So the command for that is nltest slash DC list. Notice on the top, this is Bancor PDC is the primary domain controller. But notice on the bottom, he's getting completely different result, which is a decoy result. And notice that all of the server names, all of the server lists are decoy server lists. They're not, they don't look anything like the actual production systems. So let's look at the local user. I'm going to see who belongs to, to the local user. So net user gives me a list of every um, domain system. And up on the top, you notice that there are several accounts that show up. You have an administrator account. You have a, um, in a, in a, in a WDG account. Notice down at the bottom, you have an admin and a default account. Administrator is missing. So this is how the sending him wrong information means that he doesn't actually have the local administrator account. He just has a list of other accounts like SCC admin or you know, the WDGA utility account. Here is the local administrator. So net local group uh, administrators tells me who belongs to the local administrator group on a system. Notice up on the top, there's an entire list of active accounts and that Ativo core slash iAdmin and the administrator indicates that they are not only local administrator accounts, but domain accounts that have local administrator access. Notice the only one listed in the bottom, which is the protected system, is SEC, SECM admin. All of the other actual local administrator accounts have been hidden. Now that we're uh, enumerating domain admin, so you look to see who belongs to the domain admins group on Active Directory. By, and this shows you that um, smohan1, da admin, i admin, you know, those are administrator accounts. Notice when you look at the bottom, we've added a bunch of different admin accounts. And we've also hidden da admin1 and administrator. So if you look, the only valid accounts that are actually being shown in the bottom is smohan1 and iAdmin. Everything else is a decoy account. Now, by splitting that, by showing some real and some fake, and then backing up all that information with the correct type of data, the attacker can't tell the difference between the real and the fake. Because when I look at a domain admin and I look up that, that user account, if you look on the left, this is the user iAdmin. And it's going to give me specific types of information about that account. Now, if you recall, administrator two was a fake user account, but it gives me the same type of, of information for that administrator account. So there's no way an attacker can tell because the right type of information is present, but it's deceptive. And notice it's not a duplicate. These are all different in the sense that the values are different and specific to each user. 
So now the attacker thinks that net user administrator two with that command, he's gotten all the details for administrator two. The, the details look correct with another account that is actually real. And so he thinks that this is a valid account as well. And that's how you can misdirect an attacker's activities based on giving him faulty information from an AD recon, which is what they do a lot of. So what does the defender see? How about every single command and, and the accounts responsible for inputting that command that happens during um, in, inside that command.exe or PowerShell uh, terminal? Notice that AD Explorer ran, uh, is, was conducted for endpoint searches, for LDAP searches across the endpoint. So that's all of those queries that the, the attacker conducted using a separate tool that he downloaded, which is AD Explorer. Notice down at the bottom, you've got command line information. SE Demo, the user that was running this account, used the set SPN to find um, all of the systems uh, for a specific um, um, service principal name. So they were doing all of these queries. So if you look down, the, the query was set SPN minus Q HTTPS, which is tell me every single service principal name that has HTTPS, so secure HTTP as an available service. So all of this information tells you what the attacker was actually looking for. And you would completely miss this if you didn't have the Active Directory security and other EDN functions, um, the, the endpoint detection net functions on the endpoint. So the, the deception modules that are installed on the endpoints are continuously watching and learning on all of the suspicious Active Directory queries from all of your endpoints. Carolyn? All right, thank you. I, you know, the demo always blows me away every time that I see this because it is so powerful to be able to, to, um, you know, not be able to grant access and give people, you know, the ability to see Active Directory so easily as it's, it's been in the past and to be able to do it in such an efficient way. I, I don't think we, we touched on it enough, but, you know, the fact that this can all be done at the endpoint and that you're not actually uh, having to interfere or touch Active Directory has made it such a compelling solution as well. So anyway, I, I know I get excited about the, 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 uh, the technology, but I think it's really neat innovation that really disrupts uh, an attacker from being able to be successful. All right, so, uh, and, and, and there's more, <laughs> you know, it's kind of fun to be able to, uh, to work with modern deception because it's definitely not the uh, honeypot of yesteryears and even the basic deception of traps and lures has changed so much. And so what you've seen so far inside of this discussion is the ability to hide and deny access. The, the next area we're gonna, we're gonna uh, go into is, is stopping the attacker from being able to even fingerprint the endpoint in, in the first place. And, so you, if you think about it, um, when an attacker scans an endpoint for services, whether they're looking for SQL, web, SSH, FTP, Telnet, you know, et cetera, you know, to attack, um, the endpoint forwards any scans that touch a closed port to a decoy for investigation. And you think about the power of that, because these type of alerts, if you were even looking for them, would not be things that you would take action on, right? So you would ignore these low level alerts and you would give the attacker the ability to be able to, to get the lay of the land and be able to determine vulnerabilities and misconfigurations inside of the systems that they can, they can exploit. So this is incredibly powerful um, from being able to detect an attacker early, very early in the attack process and doing something that other security controls would, uh, would typically make. So it's kind of fun to be able to turn now instead of uh, interweaving every, uh, you know, decoys through the, uh, through the network, now you can make every endpoint on the network a decoy, um, really making it difficult for the attacker to be able to move off of it or leverage it in any way to advance their attack. And so, um, why don't we dig a little deeper, uh, deeper into how this exactly works? Great, thank you. So if you can think about what an attacker is doing when they're on an endpoint and they're doing port and service scans, what they're looking for is they're looking for valid services and open ports on every IP address that they get a response from when they're looking, or when they're doing their host discovery. And like I said, they're not really scanning anymore. They're just going point to point. Now consider this. There is a module on the endpoints that is deception-based that looks for every scan. It looks for scans that touch closed ports. 
which means that open ports aren't going to be touched. It's not going to interfere with any production services that you have running. So for example, if I put the deception module on a web server, the web server is going to have several ports that are open uh, as part of production. Usually something like port 22 for SSH, you can manage it. You're gonna have port 80, port 443 for the open and, and secure HTTP access. And maybe you'll have a database, maybe you'll have an FTP port open, or you're going to use SCP secure copy across SSH to move files to and from that web server. Those open ports are going to respond the way they're supposed to. But what if I, as an attacker, went and looked for a DNS port, an open port 53 on that web server? Well, now the module is going to see that, hey, this IP address is querying me on port 53, which is a closed port for DNS that the web server doesn't run. I'm going to take that query and I'm going to forward it to a fake DNS server with fake information that points to decoys. So that DNS server, that, that DNS query is now getting a response from a fake DNS server with fake information. Now that's going to do two things. First, it's going to make the attacker think that the IP address that he queried on port 53 has DNS services, when in reality, it doesn't. So that already ruins his fingerprinting right there. He thinks that that IP address, whatever it is, you know, 10.1.1.250, for example, has open port 53, and it's a DNS server. It's running DNS services, when in fact, 1.250 does not have anything open but port 22, port 80, and port 443. So his fingerprinting is bad. Second, the information he's gathering is now faulty. He has engaged with a decoy and he's pulling fake information from that decoy. But what else is he doing? He's just letting you know that he's attacking because that decoy just raised an alert and is now recording all the activity that he's doing as he's engaging with that decoy while he thinks he's engaging with a regular production system. Now, the really cool part about this is that you can do this both inbound and outbound traffic. Meaning, if the system, if the, if, the, if the deception environment knows what services are supposed to be running on VLANs, and it sees you attempting to query a particular service on a VLAN that isn't running it, from your endpoint, it's automatically going to forward all outbound traffic to a decoy on that port, for that port. Inbound traffic, same way. Uh, which was the example that I showed where that web server was receiving inbound queries. And so it redirected that query to a decoy. Now, what if I said I can limit all inbound and outbound activity to only talk to a decoy? Now I have quarantining functions. So now if I say, if I realize that this attacker is, or this system is fully infected and the attacker is launching their attacks, I can say, I want to limit all inbound and outbound traffic to only talk to the decoys in the decoy environment. Now, everything he does is only going to go to the decoys and the only responses he can get is from the decoys. He's now isolated from the network. That is native um, quarantine and isolation technology that is now part of the deception platform. So like I said, it takes away the attacker's ability to fingerprint the system. It's giving you alerting on all the attacker activity, attempting to, to touch any port on any system, and you now have native quarantining functions. And that's really the power of this deflection activity. This, it, it just makes it so difficult for an attacker to not only find active systems, identify what is real, but also once you quarantine them, talk to anyone but a decoy in the decoy environment. And that is extremely powerful for, for, uh, for the defender because you're not even letting the attacker know that he's engaging with decoys and deception. Carolyn, back to you. All right. So kind of wrapping, wrapping the picture up and things, we talked about the ability to hide things, uh, deny access to things, to be able to prevent fingerprinting. But as we talked about earlier on, there is, you know, layers of security. And in this case, these, there are layers of deception that people can use in order to, again, mitigate the risk associated with an attack. And so what you see in the diagram, and, and again, the, the piece that some people will look at and go, okay, that seems like a lot of things, but you can start um, small, but also know that you're able to grow. 
And what I mean by that is, is you may decide, okay, I want to go ahead and put the endpoint uh, deceptions out there so that I can uh, look for credential theft. I can prevent, um, you know, that from happening. I can uh, put this deflect functionality on, uh, on things as well to be able to look for unauthorized port scans. Um, but then maybe I want to go upstream a little bit, you know, a little bit more. Maybe I want to put some decoys out there to um, obfuscate the attack surface. And I can do that on my user network. I can do it in my data centers. And if I know I'm going to be moving into the cloud or I am in the cloud today, I might start thinking about um, how do you do decoy Lambda functions? How do I decoy for containers? Um, how do I uh, be able to have a comprehensive view of all of the threat activity across my multi-cloud environments? And so one of the neat things about the technology today is, is that it has a, a great degree of scalability. So you can go user networks, you can go cloud, you can go remote work sites as we've seen today. And there's some pretty interesting things that you can do around um, remote worker infrastructure. And if I think a lot about, you know, what's happening with legal entities today, you know, it's everything is changing, right? Everything from how data is stored, how it's shared, how um, trials and everything are going on. And so you need to be able to deal with data and information in a very distributed environment, but it can't be so, com be so complex to manage. And so the neat thing with deception is, is that whether you're using a decoy or some of this other concealment technology is, is that it's very, uh, you know, non-disruptive to the organization and very easy to maintain with uh, things like machine learning that will go out and learn all of these environments and propose back to you the uh, proposed configurations, which you can automatically apply or look at them depending upon how you want to manage the deployment. And this allows you now to get the deception out onto the, uh, you know, out into your remote workers. You can look for insider threat activity. You can look for other third party um, activity that could be uh, against policies and be able to pick up that information again, without disrupting any network operations. Um, other area that it can flow into, maybe not as relevant for a lot of the uh, law firms, is the areas of looking at uh, you know, point of sale or industrial control or looking uh, like an energy substation, much, which may fee seem a little more far-fetched. But what's not so far-fetched is looking at to be, uh, being able to put decoys in, like uh, decoy uh, routers, switches, or VoIP infrastructure. And so um, for businesses, both small and large, um, being able to have that very high fidelity detection in a non-disruptive way and having it provided early and be all, all be very powerful uh, things for you to be able to reduce your risk and respond to, uh, to security threats with very limited uh, security teams. All right, so one of the other things I did want to touch on, I mean, it's always hard with security, you talk about ROI, right? If I put this in, what kind of an ROI do we, uh, do we get back? And, and I'm really happy to share some of the information that uh, Deceptive Defense, an independent uh, organization run by Kevin Fiscus has uh, put out. And he's taken a lot of the, the kind of common data by Poneman and others about uh, costs. And then he's taken a look at how deception works. And he's been able to work these into some formulas and examples that show that you can reduce the cost of a data breach by 51% or about $75 per compromised uh, record. And on the flip side, you can also get a lot of efficiencies in your SOC. And in this case, he's looking at about a 30% reduction. And so there is a lot of power um, in being able to, again, a you know, reduce the cost of um, you know, actual incidents as well as, as just be more effective and productive overall by leveraging the fidelity of the detection alerts, by uh, leveraging the automated uh, attack analysis, and by automating the incident response actions with your existing security controls. All right, so let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Ativo Networks is the sponsor of, um, of this session today. and We're thrilled to be able to have an opportunity to talk with our legal community. We do have a very strong base of uh, legal customers. I always joke around like Fight Club, first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club, first rule of deception is you don't talk about deception, but um, what we can do is if you are interested in looking uh, for references or information from a fellow uh, legal entity, we will get uh, generally be able to get our referrals to talk to each other, just not in an open session. Um, but what I can tell you is, is that we have a variety of different, um, both law firms and uh, legal entities within larger corporations that are using the Threat Defend platform in various forms. So some on the BotSync, the kind of the flagship product, which has been all around the decoy deceptions and engagement. 
the endpoint detection net, which brings forward all of the uh, ability to detect the credential theft, hide those uh, file shares, folders, and drives, um, be able to tell you the attack paths of an attacker, uh, as well as the ports and services deflection, as well as the Active Directory um, protection. And so that all can be uh, purchased within the endpoint detection net, as well as uh, AD Secure can be sold separately by itself because it is a fairly significant problem on its own. And uh, some people have an interest in, in starting there, but collectively you can start anywhere and build upon each, uh, build upon each other. All right, so, oops, a little, a little too quick on the slide there. Um, the other thing is you're considering, is this right for me, right? You know, there's a lot of cool technology that's out there, but is it a good fit for my organization? I highly encourage you to look at the uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, you see an example of it here. You see the 12 different tactics and hundreds of, of different sub-tactics underneath it. And what you can see is in the, um, yellow color where deception technology specifically fits in and what you can see here is is the ability to boost the detection performance over edr systems by an average of 42 percent um, and that is done through actual testing um, similar to what uh, MITRE ATT&CK did with the APT29 and APT3 testing. Um, we used their DIY kit and tested Ativa with the same methodology and were able to show that we could boost the performance. Not double counting anything, but simply by adding this technology in, you can get better um, visibility to credential access, to discovery, lateral movement and collection. And by doing all of those things, you're able to get a better detection performance. All right, so bringing this all back together, um, you know, why, <laughs> why do you need this type of technology? You need protection for all of your uh, network devices. And today there are different limitations. And again, it's not that an EPP or an EDR or other solutions uh, are not good. They are good at what they do, but they definitely have distinct gaps that we are able to close those gaps and be able to create a better together story and uh, give you better prevention and detection. Um, it's a great uh, system for insider threat and being able to get visibility to things even related to human error, um, misconfiguration, uh, things that may happen if your hygiene is not quite up to order. And we'll get visibility into things when they're not acting as they should. Um, we'll give you coverage for both on-premise cloud, remote locations, and also into these different specialized uh, environments as well as infrastructure. So again, a very efficient and effective way of getting early detection um invisibility to threats that are out on on the network last uh information here who's ativa we are a global company uh, we operate in all the major geographies you see the little orange boxes there as to where our offices are um, we've got hundreds of customers globally um, some may think well deception is only for the biggest of companies and yes we do have over half of the fortune 10 but also 65 percent of our business is uh, for organizations with less than 5,000 employees. Um, I can tell you we have companies that have 25 people and if you're dealing with highly sensitive data and you need to make sure that you can accurately detect and do it with a small staff, even some that don't even have anybody with security in their, their IT teams uh, titles, it is a very effective way for being able to get the detection and be able to respond quickly. Okay. So uh, wrapping everything up here, um, I, I'd ask you if you're ready to check it out, uh, you can go to request a demo at ativonetworks.com slash demo, or you can uh, set up a meeting and one of our security specialists can have a chat with you more about this. But it is really a lot of uh, interesting and innovative technology that um, I'd encourage you to take a look. It's very different. Um, a lot of the deception platforms out there operate in very different ways. Um, Ativo does some pretty unique and interesting things to deal with today's uh, advanced attackers. So I'd en encourage you to reach out and take a look. Uh, Joseph, any parting thoughts, words that you want to include before we sign out? Uh, just that uh, we've had a very good, strong relationship with uh, ILTA and uh, the um, legal set community. And so uh, please uh, feel free to check us out and uh, we'll be more than happy to have uh, uh, fruitful discussions with everybody. Yes, and on that too, on the uh, request to demo here, there is a specific uh, place you can go onto the website as well to get a free trial of the uh, 80, um, 80 secure technology. So you can get a few licenses you can set up and be able to test and see the results yourself as far as being able to conceal uh, 80 objects from attackers. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that as well for our legal community. So many thanks again for tuning in today and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their day.